And we're going to waste some time now, Patrick Alexander over at Inspiration Trust. Um, Patrick, how the devil are you? I'm very well, Martin. How are you? It's, it's I, I hope I'm all right. It's uh, <laughs> it's love. It's it's the weather over here is a bit grey at the moment, but hopefully it'll brighten up later. Um, you're at Inspiration Trust. There's been a few changes there over mm. the past few months or so. Mm. We'll, we'll talk about those in a bit. Mm. But tell me. What's your role over there? Um, so I started a couple of months ago. I'm the new director of curriculum and teacher development. And that, that's very, <laughs> I, like, I like the full stop there. That caught me somewhat by surprise. Sorry about that. Um, tell me about this role. Um, so the trust invested in, in uh, curriculum or started to invest in curriculum quite heavily a few years ago. Um, and so there's, there has always been a director of education or, or curriculum or similar. Um, and so, but I think this is, th this uh, version of the role is slightly different and it encompasses teacher development as well. Uh, so it's about bringing those two aspects together into, into one area of responsibility. And where were you before? Uh, so I was in teacher development uh, at uh, Teach First, so I was working in schools um, across London um, in initial teacher training um, and uh, yeah, I did a couple of years there, so that was, that was that sort of fed into the teacher development aspect here at Inspiration. And you're an English, English teacher by trade? Yeah, that's right, so I, I, um, I'm an English specialist. Um, I trained uh, through Teach First, taught in London um, for a while, then abroad for a couple of years, and then in um, sort of curriculum leadership roles in, in English um, in a couple of schools in London for, for six years, um, uh, then as a head of English, and then as a freelance consultant. And um, it's, it's run by a dame, isn't it? Dame Rachel D'Souza, who runs, is, yes. Dame who Rachel runs, D'Souza uh, is yeah. our great leader. Yes. <laughs> and there are schools all over, mainly Norfolk, I believe. And I've certainly visited a couple in Norwich there. That's and right. Yes. A couple in Suffolk, is that right? Or yeah, is that? Yeah. Yeah. And tell me, how, do you know how many schools there are in the trust, or is that too much of a. 14. Uh, uh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the factual questions you see so it's good to see you retaining the knowledge and uh <laughs> able to bring it out like well done um now there's been some changes we were talking about because uh, inspiration trust was famous or notorious for an episode a couple of years ago which i'll call the bucket full of sick episode um it's not quite like that a bucket of sick not bucket full uh, bucket to be sick in let's let's get this absolutely right bucket to be sick in um next to a child or something like that i mean it was it was all sorts of um i suppose the press getting hold of something and running with it quite a lot of that but tell me um things have changed somewhat that was the past this is the future tell me yeah so um yeah i'm familiar with that headline um um you know, and I think it would probably be unwise for me to talk a lot about it because this is this really you know, happened before I started. Um, you know, I know that it was probably a kind of an expression of an attempt to have a no excuses um, uh, sort of behaviour, approach to behaviour. Um, and to, you know, really, really focus on um, making sure that... <clears throat> you know, less lessons were um, accessible for everybody, um, you know, as, as much as possible. Uh, and, and I think that's, you know, I, that's how I understand it looking back. But I think this is, that is part of the past. Um, and, you know, looking forward, um, I suppose, yeah, we have made some changes, which we, which we announced at the conference just before half term. Um, and I guess we're working quite hard on inclusion um, and, in and equality at the moment. So it's about, um, yeah, I, you know, I don't think that was a particularly helpful headline. I'm not sure if it was particularly kind of fair uh, depiction of what was necessarily happening in that context. But, um, you know, certainly paused, gave us pause for thought. 
Um, and I think what's really nice is, is we've had an opportunity to, to think about our identity um, and what, we're, what we stand for. Um, and that, that has led to the creation of some principles which really bind together our thinking um, about that for um, the years ahead. Okay, so you, I mean, when you say no excuses, I, I, I take it you're not having a, a policy of excuses now necessarily, but <laughs> it's something that um, I think um, Dame Rachel herself tweeted before half term about moving from traditional to progressive, which obviously two words that um, resonate in quite a lot of um, debates on Twitter, certainly, if not edu twitter at least um can you tell me what what she might have meant by that well i think it's important to be um completely clear about what she tweeted i mean i i i can't quote the the tweet verbatim but i think what she said was she wanted to reclaim the word progressive rather than moving from traditional to to progressive um and of course it's a bit of a you know it's a it's a live rail and in, in the debate you know it's it is a it's a word which has all sorts of um, associations. Uh, but ultimately, I think what we're trying to do is move away from unhelpful binaries. Um, you know, and I was really, you know, I've always felt for, for a long time um, in education, um, you know, I've, I've been in education in some um, shape or form since 2005, um, that some of the, the language around pedagogy and curriculum is, is unhelpful um and polarizes debate um and you know that kind of leads to sort of enormous pendulum swings in in policy some of which have been really important so i think that the reforms that the huge sort of waves of reform that we've seen over the last 10 years um, a lot of them um have been you know, were necessary welcome um in terms of thinking about knowledge in terms of thinking about pedagogy um but the problem with you know, polarization and binaries is that it means that, you know, if you if you only think in, in those terms, then there's very little room for subtlety, nuance. Um, and, you know, what you might end up with is a kind of, and I think this is possibly something which we try to think about in, in our principles is an overcorrection uh, of one way of thinking, let's say progressive, to another way of thinking, which is traditional or new or traditional or neo-traditional. Um, now, the, the problem with, um, as I say, with that way of thinking is it tends to, it tends to create kind of sort of violent changes in, in, in policy. And I think, you know, when Rachel said she wanted to reclaim um, the word progressive, you'd have to ask her what, 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 she, what, she, what she means by that. But I, you know, for me, I think the important thing to emphasize is that if you just hammer away at these uh, you know, the, uh, words like traditional, then you're going to get quite a static interpretation of what we're doing in schools. And, you know, given some of the, you know, the cultural debates we've been having in society, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's timely to consider what being purely traditional would, would really mean in the school's context and what some of the implications of that are. Um, you know, because it's it's kind of unfortunate the word progressive has got ha, had some of the associations it's had in education because we still want even if we don't want to use the word progressive because you know in in sort of 2008 let's say it meant a purely discovery learning approach with lots of um you know group work and brain gym and funny hats and plasticine and all the rest of it um you know, I think now when we're thinking about the ideas about oh, about progress in society, it feels unfortunate that we can't use the word progressive in an education context. So I think that's probably what Rachel was driving at. But, you know, again, you'd have to ask her. Yeah, of course. Um, in, in terms of progressive as an ideal and, and tradition as an ideal, I suppose I could see that you could get caught in that binary and say we are a progressive education institution or we are a traditional institution and those two things but but do the two things sit well together 
as ideas or I mean, is there is there an inherent contradiction there I, I perhaps give you an example over the national trust you know <laughs> that where where the um debate perhaps is being had in all sorts of institutions whether it's the bbc or or the american elections whatever it happens to be that there is this tension and whether an institution can marry these things together easily or not is is in itself an interesting question yeah, and I think that's why we've 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 come up with these principles, um, which I think we'll come on to later, because inherent in the design of these principles is an acknowledgement of that tension. Um, you know, the structure of the of the principles both states, for example, in, in curriculum terms, that we are very much um, our thinking is driven by uh, knowledge, the importance of knowledge, teaching knowledge. Uh, powerful knowledge, but also acknowledging that that's not a necessarily a fixed idea. You know, it's, just, it's important to think about what, you know, a canon is, um, what has been canonical, what may be canonical. I mean, it's impossible to predict what's going to be canonical in the future, but at least acknowledging the importance of debate about these things. So there's a sort of elasticity or a flexibility in our, in our principles, which should allow some more sophisticated thinking than perhaps might have been um, the case before. And that's not to say that, you know, we weren't able to think in a nuanced way before that, but I think to trying to articulate it um, has felt important. And, you know, you've just given some really good examples of um, contexts where um, a consideration of those sort of polarizing words um, needs to be like, band together in in some way um and so it's yeah it's really interesting work and you had a conference just before half term and um you were looking at a, a variety of issues the, again this was seen on social media some some of the stuff was um put out there um can you tell me how that went and what was was the thinking behind it yeah so the theme was equality um the year before was inclusion and it was just a really Good opportunity for us to get together um, as uh, a group of schools uh, and consider um, that word, um, what we're doing to try and um, make sure that we are you know, creating the best possible opportunities for students in our trust. I'm um, here from a range of speakers uh, about issues um, to do with diversity, to do with curriculum, um, to do with behaviour, to do with um, making sure that everyone can access um, the curriculum that we're delivering um, and also, you know, to reflect on, yeah, on who we are as a trust um, and some of this new thinking that we've been um, putting into our principles and policy writing um, and sort of a general review of, you know, of, of where we're at and assessing our, our, our strategy for the next few years. So, yeah, I think that's it. And um in terms of when you say a word equality, obviously that conjures up again lots of ideas that perhaps the word tradition and the word progressive do as well. What do you mean by equality? Do equality of opportunity, equality of outcome? I mean, what 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 do you mean by the word equality? Um so I think you've just given a couple of examples there. Um I mean, other sort of related issues might be equity. Um, uh, so some thinking around that. Um, we had uh, a presentation uh, on um, diversity and I identity. Um, and again, I suppose we go back to what you're saying about equality of opportunity. Um, um, and I think, you know, it's sort of, it's a bit of an umbrella term for a, a lot of sort of, um, more specific uh, presentations and sessions run by a whole range of teachers in the trust on that in that kind of broad area. So I guess for me, I was asked to speak about Black Lives Matter. Um, and that was a really interesting challenge for me. Uh, I just joined the trust. Um, it's, it's obviously a kind of, it's such a, it's been such a, an extraordinary a moment really in sort of global conversation that it felt like a huge responsibility to have to con present uh, the trust thinking on this in what 50 minutes 
Hmm. Um, and I think if I asked anybody to speak up about um, that particular subject for 50 minutes, um, well, it wouldn't be hard to fill the time, but it's also because there's so much to say, but it's also a very sensitive area. Um, and it's one where I felt conscious of my identity. Um, and, you know, some of, one of the sort of, I suppose, one of the big um, insights that we've, that we've gained from this conversation is um, the importance of perspective um, and the lens that your identity brings to your understanding of the world. So um, the way I decided to do it was in a, an interview um, with a former student of mine um, about his experience of the curriculum, um, maybe of bias and prejudice in his experience of school, uh, and also um, of my my lessons, so sort of trying to do some reflection on that. And so I shared that with the trust, and it seemed to go over okay. So I was I was pleased with that. But in terms of equality, I suppose you know the relevance of that conversation to quality is, you know, is, is fairly clear. It's just trying to make sure that people uh, are treated fairly um, in the work we're doing in the trust. And I think that's, so yeah, I hope that, I hope that was clear in my, in my session. Right. And this sort of moves towards a couple of things you are bringing in, which are the principles. Yeah. Five principles. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to take me through a couple of them? Yeah, so we this came about as a result of preparation for the, the conference and thinking about our strategy. Um, and again, it was about trying to articulate some of those uh, those those tensions that we've we've talked about in this conversation um, in a way that um, I think sustains some of the work we've been doing already, um, but also um, takes us forward um, as a trust. And so we have our first one on behavior. I mean, I can, I think it, it wouldn't hurt us to read out some of these principles. So the first one, we have rules and systems to ensure good behavior so that all children can learn disruption free. But we realize that behavior needs to be taught and some children need more support to reach that standard than others. So again, it's about, I suppose, reiterating the importance of supporting um, all students to reach the standard of behavior that's going to allow everyone to learn and include you know include including all students um, as far as possible in that so we've got the second one um, is about social norms so we we raise our children to be comfortable in the social norms of most workplaces but we think hard about where those norms may not feel inclusive we went we want our children to feel welcome um, so again, you know, this is about um, just doing some some sophisticated thinking about, I suppose, what the conventional expectations of society might be in preparing students for that, but also thinking about about what that social norm might exclude, whether it's a cultural thing, whether it's to do with a mode of dress or uh, or, or or a haircut or something, um, and trying to make sure that when we you know, when we are tackling that kind of specific um, expression of, of culture, we're doing it in a way that, that is inclusive and doesn't exclude people. Um, and I suppose that's not just about our schools, it's also about trying to, you know, it's about what contribution, contribution we're making to society as well. I suppose that, that does come back to the idea of, of being progressive in some way. Um, again, acknowledging that that's a, a word which has an, an awful lot of associations in, in education. And acknowledging, of course, the difficulty of getting a haircut at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I think both of us uh, can, can model that. Uh, during the interview. Um, yeah, and then we've got a third one. Um, we use routines to make school efficient and increase learning time. But we ensure that over time the scaffolding is removed to prepare children for the independence of adulthood so I mean that speaks for itself really routines obviously schools need routines children need routines um, but if you if you kind of over if you structure every element of a young person's life all the way through their school experience it you know it may cr 
create a problem for them um, once you remove all those structures. So the idea is to, I suppose, on a sliding scale, remove some of that um, scaffolding uh, to allow students to to become to, to have a little bit of independence and um, be able to to think for themselves ultimately. And I think that's kind of a you know that's that's a better preparation for adulthood than structuring absolutely everything everything for them all the time. And I think that's kind of a way of thinking that informs on all these principles. Um, now the ones that the principles that are particularly relevant to my area of work are principle four and five. Um, so I think you've got the slide there for principle four. Um, so we teach powerful knowledge so that children can understand, access and influence our society. But we also teach critiques of this knowledge to give our children an edge and show them that a canon is always up for debate. Um, so that might take some a bit more unpicking. Well, I mean, from from my perspective, you've just uh, focused in on the trivium there, of course, which is right. <laughs> the relationship between knowledge and then critique of that knowledge, the the grammar and the dialectic, and, and pulling those two things together very cool. easily. But the, the the interesting thing that these questions bring out, of course, is what knowledge, whose knowledge, and then how. I, I talk about it with the the idea of. Uh, the the butterfly being crushed on the wheel that a few years ago William Rees Mogg I think mentioned in one of his Times um, editorials about Mick Jagger. Anyway, that doesn't matter. <laughs> if you've got if you've got Nelson right up there on his column, and you've got some people who want to push it down. How do you balance that? <laughs> do you half push it like Leaning Tower of Nelson? You know what I mean. How yeah, do, it's interesting you, that you've, how do you hold these things in tension if, if it means some things remain very much in place? Um, well, I think it's very interesting that you've chosen the, the example of a, of a statue there, because obviously that seems very relevant to some of the events of this year. Um, um, I suppose, you know, there's a, there are a couple of arguments here. There's the harsh argument, um, you know, cultural literacy, and there's the Michael Young argument of powerful knowledge. So, so I think in the trust, we acknowledge that it's important that, you know, we, we teach um, elements of knowledge, which are sort of, which have, you know, some degree of, uh, of status, um, which are gonna allow access to society. Um, but also I think, you know, Michael Young's sort of riff on that is, to you know, envisage alternatives. Um, now, how you make that happen in the curriculum is pretty tricky. Um, and you know, the, way, the perspective I come at this from, Martin, is you know, for a long time in my and I, I need to speak about this as an English teacher. And I know it doesn't really apply to to all subjects equally. And then I've just had a meeting with my team where we are trying to unpick how in maths or science or you know my you know, subject lead in, in geography was also saying maybe in geography too, it's hard to sort of teach critiques of, of knowledge because epistemologically um, it doesn't make a great deal of sense and it might not be relevant to the students, uh, the students uh, you know, pre, up to the age of 16. But I think we do need to, to sort of, from, it, from, from an English point of view, we just didn't really teach knowledge for a long time in my subject area. Um, and you know, I think this argument's been one, we needed to, um, try and address the fact that we had a, a, this, a focus on uh, on skills and there wasn't really a requirement to know very much. Um, and that's really what got me interested in curriculum in a big way. Um, and that's taken us very, that's taken us far, you know, I think it's been really influential. We can see it in all aspects of policy from the direction that um, Ofsted have taken to um, the, what does the work in schools um, across the country is, is very curriculum focused. But I also think that that can lead to an overcorrection where if we just teach a static interpretation of that knowledge, then, you know, as I think Benny Cara said, that can be to, to lead to an unacceptable, un unacceptable lack of diversity in the curriculum. Um, now, that, that doesn't mean we suddenly have to stop teaching Shakespeare. I think it's very important that we keep teaching Shakespeare. But it also means that we need to 
to sort of to think about how the the we see representation in the in the curriculum um so that students can see themselves in what they're studying um so that, but also see beyond their experiences as well so there are kind of a number of elements that we're trying to that we're trying to balance as you say um i think you know a sort of a parody of the idea of teaching critiques would be you know for a teacher to read this principle and then go away and try and sort of deconstruct Abrahamic religion uh, with an 11 year old um, and think that that's going to lead to uh, a really uh, a purposeful educational outcome. That's not what I would like to see. But some acknowledgement in curriculum planning and maybe even a discourse in the classroom that um, we're, we're teaching things, um, you know, because they have been culturally important, but that is that doesn't mean that that won't change. Um, you know, I think that's, I think we need to think hard about these things. Otherwise we just get, I suppose we get to a point where we're just teaching things because that's the way it is. And that doesn't really, you know, and on the basis of authority. And I think that doesn't really seem like um, a sustainable vision for curriculum over time. There's also the argument that perhaps is addressed by more conservative thinking. Um, with a small c and perhaps with a big c yeah. but the idea of we the idea of nation nation state our island story you know all, all these things that create a narrative that can bring people together um and then the opposite view sort of more liberal thing which is um humanity first rather than the nation state um all stories all all religions into the melting pot and it's it's that tension that that perhaps plays out certainly in the national trust argument about um, Winston Churchill's Chartwell, you know whether it should say that he his colonialist ideas should be um, examined in 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 a place like that. Um, if if we take if we use critique too much, does it destroy the stories of we bringing us together, or shouldn't we even think of those as being relevant as useful? Um, that, that there is no English literature, there is literature, there is um, no English history, there's history. I'm, I'm, I'm putting these things deliberately to um, try and hear what you might say about them. Um, I think there's some, um, you know, we've already spoken about um, the Hirschian argument of access to society. And I think he started off by thinking about you know, will this young person, when they finish their experience of school, be able to read the New York Times? And that was sort of a proxy for um, being culturally literate. And that was fine. I don't think he, even he has listened to an interesting conversation between um, him and I think it was Greg, on Greg Atkins' podcast. He's sort of thinking a bit more critically about, you know, whether or not that was a, quite a sort of um, a, a white eurocentric kind of measure of where we've got to um in terms of cultural literacy and maybe that needs to be thought about um a little bit more delicately um but i so and i think in a british context that is always going to involve um you know studying um texts history which are you know related to our, yeah, as you say, our island story. And there is a lot to be proud of there, but there is, it's also not sufficient to, that's not a, that's not the end of the story. Um, I, the reason I talk about pride, I think it is important for, for students to, to take pride in where they're from. But if you only take that attitude, then you're not gonna teach the empire very effectively. Um, so I think trying to obviously um, teach slavery, um, trying to, you know, and, and you know, the, the slave trade, trying to teach a full understanding of what the island story really is, is obviously going to be very important. Um, I think, so there's sort of, that's an honest appraisal of what that story is. But I think also, <clears throat> you know, there are other elements. I think the curriculum should consider the local community that it's um, being delivered to. How is that represented? Um, whether that's in East Anglia or in East London um, or any, anywhere else in, in the UK. 
So there's a reflection there, it's like a mirror, but it should also be a window to the world. So I think, you know, there does need to be, a, there does need to be a, a way in which the, the, the um, global history, global literature is considered. Um, you know, if you take the, the example of, of English, you know, in 20, well, I'd say it's about eight years ago, curriculum reform created a, a much stronger focus on um, so Victorian texts, for example. And I think some of that work was necessary, but it also did, did create quite a narrow focus on, you know, long um, Victorian novels. Now, I think we should be proud of our contribution um, to um, global literature, but if you teach that exclusively, that doesn't seem like a fair representation of the possibilities of, of the subject. And, you know, I know from having studied English for a long time that the whole subject area is completely, is, is sort of reimagining itself all the time in, in a way that's, you know, makes it very hard to kind of, to, to pin it down to what its identity really is. But I think at school, at a school level, we can absolutely capture some of that debate and some of the, the curriculum and choices that we're making. And your fifth slide, um, your fifth, sorry, your fifth principle, fifth slide. It's a slide <laughs> <laughs> on it. Have you got that there? Yeah, so um, I don't know if you've got the, the, the slide on the screen, um, but I can read it back to you. There it is. <clears throat> Yeah, we guide learning carefully to ensure that all children can access the curriculum and know it. But we also challenge children to apply their thinking to complex problems, to strengthen their intellectual resilience. Um, so, I mean, I'd be, I'd be interested. I mean, how does that read to you? I mean, I've, be, I've been interpreting this to you, Martin, but I mean, what is, when you read that, how do you, how do you, how might you interpret and apply that? You see, now, now you're reversing it. So you're actually asking the interviewer well, the questions. I mean, this I, mean I, can, I can talk about it because I know what I mean by it. You know, I wrote is, it. But this I mean, what Boris Johnson does to Keir Starmer. You associated me with Boris, Boris Johnson, which is the. Which is um, but um, yeah. go I, on. I would, I would, I would go the trivium here as well. I mean, to me, the, the trivium works in this way. It, it, it involves the critique. It involves thinking about things. This is the dialectical core to it, if you like, in order to allow children freedom of thought, freedom of uh, applying thought in, in certain ways. So to me, I always referred to something like that and think, yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm on about when I talk about the trivium. But um, yeah, you tell me. You tell me. Yeah, I mean, quite. I and mean, I think that there is a sort of, there's a pedagogical, it's a pedagogical one, really. Um, <clears throat> so we scaffold, um, and you know, we we use direct instruction, and we just sort of disaggregate knowledge into its components and teach them. Um, we don't just teach the final performance. A lot of the sort of the insights into pedagogy and assessment that we've have been popularised over the last few years are sort of implied by this. But I think what we're you know, you'll, you'll notice in all of these principles, we start with a statement of what we do, and then there's a but. You know, and the but is quite, for me, is almost the most important part because it signifies the change. So what's the change here? And all these principles, we're acknowledging the tension in the debate. We're saying, we've been doing this. We've been teaching, um, sort of, uh, We've been delivering behavior, behavior, our approach to behavior in a particular way, but we're also going to um, try and approach it um, as an, in an inclusive way as possible in the future. The same with social norms, the same with routines, the same with knowledge. Um, in terms of pedagogy, I felt, well, I've only just joined a trust, so I can't speak with, with great authority on this. But at a systems level, if you, if you if there's an overemphasis on direct instruction um if there's an overemphasis on um ways of teaching which don't involve independent thinking which don't involve independent practice which don't involve the students applying their thinking to complex problems then as you say there isn't a dialectic there isn't a kind of um analytic process um which is 
you know, what academic work really must lead towards. Um, it's a method of in, it, inquiry um, and it's a method which places emphasis on the students to take responsibility for solving problems themselves. And again, that is something which is a, a theme throughout these principles. It, in, over time, we're increasing their self-reliance, uh, their understanding of things on their own terms, uh, their own personal intellectual practice. Um, and yeah, that's the best way to prepare them for adulthood, for the, the challenging intellectual work, which they, they go on to do, whether it's in the world of work or it's in further education. Um, you know, at a very simple level, that's actually, you know, that's all in Rosenstein's principles of instruction. Um, so it's not radical. Um, I suppose the only radical thing in that principle is the, the idea of intellectual resilience, which, you know, I have seen used in different contexts, um, but I think I haven't seen it used a lot in an educational context. So I suppose that's a, a sort of a newish phrase. Right. And I know you've only been there two months, but this this feels like it's more than just yourself. This is institution. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, sorry, I, I, I interrupted oh, you. Go on, go on. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think it's just a, that's a bit of a happy accident, really, or maybe why I was recruited. I don't know. But there's been it really it, what's happening in the trust really chimes with, with, with what I've learned over, I don't know how many years in schools. Um, we needed an expression of something which was, which acknowledged those tensions and tried to resolve them. And that's where these principles have come from. Now, do you think, I, can I just, can I just finish that thought? Sorry, Martin. The other sort of important thing there is that they aren't resolved. They're just written down. And the resolution comes from the other principles, i.e. the head teachers, who are about to make this real um, and and what Rachel did in her um, conference speech so this is Dame Rachel D'Souza the uh, CEO of the trust is she said this is the thinking this is a philosophical underpinning of the direction that we're we're, we're trying to take and we've you know you and I batted that back and forth during this this discussion but the really important work um, is for the principles to to first of all you know, do do our head teachers agree with these as principles? And the answer has been yes, a resounding, we really like these, we want to work with them, we want to make them real in our school. So that's where the, that's where the sort of um, how we resolve the principles is in the action and how that applies in a, in a school context. So the principles are kind of doing that now. Um, and so that's the challenge that was set in the conference speech. And I think that's kind of, you know, now is the is the is where the work comes and it'll, it, it's, potentially complex and potentially tricky but it's definitely the direction that we want to take um, is, is some of this a response to black lives matter i mean if 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 the this year hadn't been like it is and has been would these changes have happened anyway uh i, I mean I, I can't answer that question um i can't unimagine what's happened this year um you know i think in terms of the pandemic people would quite like to unimagine what's happened this year but i think um, um, you know, I just can't answer that question. I think um, you don't have to answer it, though. <laughs> I, want, I also think it's a relevant question, Martin. So I want to honour it. I think it's it's it's. Um, I don't know what was happening in the trust before I before I started, but you know, you've already sort of given what I would say is a sort of um, not particularly sort of helpful characterization in a pure headline of you know the kind of the the bucket headline that we mentioned earlier in the discussion um and you know i think so there was already sort of thinking in the trust about like how we we create a culture in schools which is hu both aspirational and humane that's how i would put it um i don't think these things need to be i mean it's kind of almost seems absurd that, that these things should be considered mutually exclusive um um and you know, and I, of course, just to sort of, you know, deal with a potential challenge to, to that characterization, of course, you know, there is a sort of the tough love approach to, to, to schooling is, is, you know, a very valid and informative and, and helpful and um, instructive one. Um, but just to go back to the, the, your question, yeah, we've been thinking about our identity. That um, thinking started before I joined the trust. If anything, 
Black Lives Matter has made everybody think harder about um, human experience um, and the primacy possibly of, of perspective and identity in the way we understand the world. And so it'd be very odd if it didn't influence our thinking in some way. Um, uh, I, I, I think I need to also address the idea that implicitly you might think this is a, there is a sort of a knee jerkism here. I definitely don't think that's the case. Um, and I think you can see that the thinking has clearly been going on in our trust um, for longer than the one answer to that question would imply. And how long will it take for the child in the classroom to see much difference? And what might that difference be? Um, I think we're still working that out. Um, you know, I had a meeting with my curriculum team today. Um, and I think it's uh, the way our trust works, and I, I don't know about other trusts, I'm sure there are similar versions of this in other trusts. We have um, subject specialist leads um, who are responsible for a subject discipline, um, geography, history, science, and so on. Um, and I think the way it works is it's there's a collaborative process whereby those subject specialist leads in the central team will speak to curriculum leads in school and they'll be, answer, they'll be trying to answer that kind of question. You know, and my director of maths, my director of maths, the director of maths, um, you know, I think, you know, her take on, on some of this is it, maybe it's not hugely relevant to her subject area. Um, of course, you know, across the principles, there's lots of stuff which is, is, is acutely relevant to that, to all subject areas. But, you know, the idea of canon might not be more, might, might not be so relevant in certain subjects. And so we've been, we've started that work. Um, you know, my um, sort of sub, my specialist lead in RE, for example, is really excited in terms of, you know, how to try and situate some of the work that, that, um, um, that she's been doing in her school um, in the context of a wider debate in which, you know, uh, critiques are possible. But as I keep saying, there's a time and a place to introduce critiques and it would be crazy to try and introduce them too early. Um, because you know, young people just don't know what to do with that, with 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 some of that um, material, um, you know, at that certain stage of development. You know, I I remember as an English teacher, I introduced them to my some, uh, I think probably year 11s, the idea of Roland Barthes' uh, death of the author. You know, it just completely blew their minds in a way that I'm not sure of, you know was necessarily very helpful. Um, but actually, it led to a really interesting discussion. You know, and you know, to, to an extent that I managed it okay, I think it was a productive lesson in which they had a real kind of reality um, sort of shifting perspective on how you interpret a text and, you know, how that, what happens in that process and what the reader's role is and how the reader makes that real and, and, and so on and so forth. But yes, it's important to exercise caution as to when you would introduce this kind of, this kind of critique and how you would do it. And we're still working that out, I would say. We could talk for ages, Patrick, and certainly now we're into French philosophy. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll go all the way through to post structuralism and, and post post structuralists and, and, and the whole lot, you know, with without mentioning yeah. Derrida, but I've just mentioned Derrida, so so that that's and Foucault and all that. Yeah. <laughs> but we're not I going to I talk about and, it. I, and I just and I do want to say before we close the conversation, I think that you know, if you look at sort of it's a sort of familiar story about Picasso um, sort of under, sort of learning uh, painting in a kind of a formal orthodox way before he, he, he started his greater work. Now, I, I'm not, we're not teaching Picasso, we might be, um, but, you know, of course, we're, we, have to, we, we are absolutely engaged in getting the fundamentals right before we start deconstructing everything. That's not what we're about. But I think just acknowledging the existence of, of debate and is potentially fruitful and exciting um, way of, you know, making what we're doing in schools really live rather than simply through the sort of lens of authority saying, this is what it is, this is what it has to be, and this is what, what it always will be. So I'm going to I'm going to throw in an advert for my books after this. <laughs> perspectives, dialectic, debate, as well as grammar, as knowledge, and all yeah. this. 
It's all there, folks, should you want to read it. But look, Patrick, it's been lovely to talk to you. Um, good luck over there. The sun's just come out over here, so something's going well. Um, I'm sure it is over there in, in Norfolk, too. I take it you live over there now? You've moved or were you there already? I'm renting in Norwich at the moment. Um, Norwich. So if anyone's got a house to sell or, or, or a <laughs> I, or something. Yeah, no, no, I don't, I don't have a sort of uh, any products to place in this, uh, in this interview, but yeah. Um, buy Martin's book. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to talk to you. Give, give my best to all the folks over there, including Dame Rachel and all that. Yeah. Um, and um, it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank yeah, you so much, Martin. Thanks for this opportunity to, to talk about this stuff. It's been really fun. Mm -hmm.